Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, I'm so excited because today I have somebody on the show who's going to help give us insights into the future of business. John O'Bacon was born in North Allerton, North Yorkshire in England. He lived in Bedfordshire and the West Midlands before relocating to California in 2008 to live with his wife, Erica. While he has always had an interest in technology, the sea change happened in 1998 when John's older brother, Simon, introduced him to open source. John was captivated by the notion of people around the world working together to produce technology that they all shared and benefited from. This created a lifelong passion to understand every nuance of how to build productive, engaging communities where a network of minds, experience, and time can produce value together. Just imagine what is possible if we can crack the code of doing this well. He started dipping his toes into various technology communities, writing extensively for magazines and online outlets, and then joining a new government initiative called Open Advantage that provided open source training and consulting. As this initiative neared completion, Jono moved on to lead community strategy for Ubuntu, one of the most popular technology platforms in the world, ultimately becoming a community of millions of users. His career then took him to XPRIZE, where he helped launch incentive competitions that solve major challenges such as the $15 million Global Learning X Prize to build technology that teaches kids literacy without a teacher. And then he went to lead community strategy at GitHub, at GitHub, where most of the world's technology is created. At this point in his career, Jono wanted to apply the power of building communities to broader range of industries and challenges, and he started consulting for a variety and range of organizations about community and collaboration strategy. This includes industries such as financial services, entertainment, professional services, nonprofits, consumer products, security, and beyond. His clients have included Deutsche Bank, the Executive Center, Google, Mattermost, Glorious Games, Satander, and more. As his career has developed, so has his passion for his craft. Jono is determined to leave a legacy in which building powerful, productive, empowering communities is clearer and more predictable than ever before. His book, People Powered, How Communities Can Supercharge Your Business Brand and Teams is a milestone on that journey. And Jono is based in California where he lives with his wife, Erica, and his son. Jono Bacon, are you ready to help us get over the hump? <laughs> Let's do this. I'm excited. Well, I'm glad you're here. And I've given my legion a little bit about you, but can you tell us what your current passion is so that we get to know you even better? Yeah, my passion is, is, um, I I guess you could say it's not particularly current, but it's becoming even more ferocious than ever, which is when I first discovered, you mentioned it just now, uh, back communities back in 1998, the thing that really struck me, I didn't really know it at the time, was um, we're stronger together. When you bring people together and they have a shared passion and a shared ethos, it's amazing what people can produce, right? We've seen Salesforce, Oracle, SAP build communities of of over a million members. We've seen Harley Davidson uh, set up over 700 local chapters around the world. We saw, you know, the revolution in, in, uh, in the web happening with Mozilla. Um, you know, Wikipedia valued at tens of billions of dollars by the Smithsonian. It's incredible when you pull people together. The tricky thing is knowing how you do that has been, has been difficult. You know, it's a combination of psychology and workflow and technology. And my goal is to really try and figure out what the code behind that is. And, uh, and my theory here is, well, it's, I don't even think it's a theory. I, I know it's true is when we get that combination right, it doesn't just make the world a better place. It makes businesses more effective. It makes activism more effective. It's how we are uh, the best that we can be as a species. You know, as you're talking, I start thinking about so many different elements associated with, you know, purpose, clarity, communication, connection. Mm. I, I mean, there, to me, it's almost like, okay, think about it from an English alphabet perspective. And we have all of these letters and that 
for each community to be successful, it's a different way that they're configured. So we yes. have to figure out, you know, what elements have to go into the community for it to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's exactly that. The way I tend to think of it is that there's kind of three buckets of communities, three templates, I guess you could say. And I, 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 one of them is, is what I refer to as consumers. These are the people who get together because they have a shared interest. So for example, Trek BBS brings together millions of Star Trek fans. And they can't really influence the show, but they, they care about it. And there's something pleasurable about spending time with other people. It builds a sense of inclusivity with, with people who share your common interest. The second type is what I refer to as consume, uh, as, uh, as, as champions. These are people who come together and they want to go the extra mile. They, they produce documentation, they make videos, they organize local events. Um, and we've seen many examples of this around the world. I mean, I mentioned Mozilla as an example earlier on. They had people in their community making crop circles to raise awareness of this back in, in the late 90s. And then the third type is what I refer to as collaborators. And these are people who get together to build things together. So for example, the open source uh, community is, uh, has generated technology that's, you know, that's powering the phones in your pockets, the cloud infrastructure, electrical grids. You know, one such example is a, is a project called Kubernetes, which brings together over 2,000 developers from over 50 competing companies to, to, that's built technology that really powers the cloud. Each of these different models requires very subtly different ways in which you, you build them, but they all have psychology. And because, you know, the, the, the machine that all of this is running on is human brains. So, you know, when I wrote People Powered, a big chunk of it is what are the threads that go through all of these? And then how do you differentiate based upon the, the, the template that you're using? Well, also, too, I'd like to add that what we're talking about here for an organization. Um, yeah, first of all, communities can be anywhere. We know they're everywhere. They've been through here throughout of our lives. Um, even D uh, Dr. Charles Vogel, who's been on the show, talked about its community that actually has helped our species to survive. Yeah. However, when you start thinking about today's world from an you know, economy perspective, is an organization can leverage communities um, in a lot of different ways. And they can also be extensions of their customer service. Mm -hmm. They could be part of their client success program. And client success has to do with customer retention uh, and helping customers to, to be uh, better uh, with the services and solutions that you provide. And there's a lot of different, I mean, you can use it for marketing. Um, yep. A lot of different ways that community can be leveraged. And so for my listeners, I often I'm talking to people who are in you know, customer experience and customer care is that community is, is really one of the, going to be one of the core tenants in how we actually both attract as well as retain customers really from here going forward. I, I completely agree. I think what we, what we're actually seeing is we've seen a number of kind of, um, eras of the relationship between companies and their customers you know back in the earlier days um, it was very much a case that you make a product and you sell it to your to your customer and then the primary way in which they reach out to you have a relationship with you is through your is through your support line right you know something broke you need to return they can't figure out how to do something with your product and that's it the second era era was more the the company would try and broadcast information and keep people aware of what they're doing. So this would be through, you know, through newsletters, through social media, through blogging, through TV advertising. And then I think the third era that we've, we've seen, particularly in the last five years, has been the bundling of online services with products. So for example, if you go and buy a Lego set, if you buy a Disney toy, they all come with these apps. You know, any parent knows how annoying this is in some ways, because sometimes these these bundled services offer enormous value. So, for example, as we record this today, Fitbit has been bought by Google for over two billion dollars. And it's not just the fact that they make electronic fitness equipment it's that they have a whole service that analyzes your data, provides recommendations and such forth. The next the next era in my mind is that with all of those previous eras, it's been primarily broadcasting information, providing content and services to the, to the consumer. Con modern consumers don't want that anymore. What they want is a relationship with the brands. 85% of millennials have a smartphone. You know, the younger generation is growing up in a connected society. Um, I, I forget the exact statistic, but uh, you know, millennials have identified a sense of community and connectivity as a critical element in how they're choosing their workplaces. So to me, communities are the future of how businesses are going to need to operate. And, um, and, and we've already seen many examples of this succeeding. And I think we're going to see the, 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 the general application of the, this to be much broader. And, uh, and that's where I want to move us. 
Well, and I would dare to say that, uh, you know, you started talking about the, um, the younger generation. I mean, when you start looking at the, uh, you know, statistics from a demographics perspective, some of your more rapid usage is actually in the older generations. And when you start talking about the aging uh, in, ad in advanced uh, marketplaces, um, you know, of the, of the different countries, I mean, the U.S. and the baby boomers and all of that is, uh, they are the most quick to adopt. And they are the mm. ones who are seeking out community more so than the younger generation. Because the younger <laughs> generation is more self-absorbed, right? Um, right. They're gaming and things like that, where it's the older generation want to use community as a way to connect personally. Right. And I think some of that is like the older generation in my mind. And it's, 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 it's interesting kind of the swing of this, because when I was growing up, for example, in England, one of the things that the older generation always grumbled about was the fact that there wasn't a sense of community anymore, that everybody was, was heads down in their video games and this thing called the internet and whatever else. Um, and I think that the older generation has, has, has always had a hankering for that, to go back to those days of, of, of genuine community. And the young gen generation has grown up in a world of connectivity. But I think what defines a lot of their social um, definition is, is that sense of belonging. Like belonging is the thing that threads through all of this, is that we all, as human beings, when you take away the screens, the computers, the microphones, all the books in the background, you know, we want a sense of belonging. We, we need that sense of, of, of social capital. So I think the younger generation have a defining that and they're consuming that more actively, but the older generation, I think have a really good concept of what that is because, because of that kind of original piece that happened before it. Oh, most definitely. I, I, and even too, when I start thinking about going back and thinking about this whole, you know, the value and benefit to the company and extension of customer service and all of those things is that, you know, all organizations realize that we need to have knowledge workers who understand the products and services internally um, right. but we have to do a better job of starting to extend that, you know, to yeah. some people as part of our community. I am actually a certified community manager. Uh, right. And so one of the things through my certification is we talked about an indoctrination process, which is, you know, a, a very different approach and mindset than just onboarding. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Because what we want to do is we actually want people to engage, connect, participate, champion, advocate. I mean, there's an elevation cycle. Uh, you use yeah. a little bit of different terminology, but tell us about that maturation cycle that you try to help organizations to be able to create. Yeah. So th my philosophy throughout all of this, and this is wired throughout the entirety of People Powered, is that the community building a great community is about building an experience and a journey for your members. Um, and I think that the very best things that we experience in, in the world are, are well curated experiences and journeys. For example, anyone who's been to Disney world has seen this from the minute you, you pull onto the property to how you get parked to how you buy your tickets. I mean, they're expensive, but how you get through and how you are kind of moved through the park. Every, every single decision has been carefully curated. Um, one of the challenges I think we face with a lot of people who do community management is that the natural urgency is to go out and build awareness and growth. So people spend a lot of money on advertising, social media, content, and things such as that. The first step in my mind is you have to bring people in and you have to, if, if someone's going to, if you go and do all the advertising and bring people in and they come to your front door, you want to make sure that the, the indoctrination, the on-ramp of that is as smooth and as simple as possible. So what I've developed over the years is something that I call my community participation model. And basically the first step is that you, you define your target audiences that you want to reach out to. So you say, okay, I want to bring in people to write software or I want people to produce documentation. I want people to, to, to provide support. Um, so you're providing kind of the, the, um, the supply part of the supply and demand piece, right? So when people come in and ask questions, you want people to be able to provide answers, for example. So we carve out those personas. And then what you do is you want them to get to the first piece of value that they can generate for themselves and the community as quickly as possible. So let's say you want to set up a community of people who are going to provide help around your product, which is very common. Um, you want people to be able to provide an answer as quickly and as effectively as possible. And carving out that on-ramp where they the step one of that on-ramp and then the final step is always the same. The first step is what is the point of someone joining your community? What is, what's in it for them? What do they get out of it? What's going to take them away from their fr friends, families, playstations, and whatever else. And then the final step is when they've made that first contribution, validating it is making it clear. We value what you did. We appreciate what you've accomplished here. And that is one piece of it. I think when you, when you craft that well, it means that it's the easiest possible way for people to join your community in the same way that the very first level of 
pretty much every video game is a tutorial level for people to pick up the dynamics of how the game operates. The gaming industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, has figured out the importance of that. The key thing then is you then step into a journey where you start out as a casual member where you don't really know anyone, you feel a bit weird, you've got a bit of imposter syndrome, you don't want to put a foot wrong and look stupid. And then the, you eventually evolve into a regular where you're there most days participating and then a very small number of these people will become core members. And the way in which we move people forward through those three phases is through a series of incentives. And the reason why I break it into those three phases is because each phase requires different bits of strategy. So for example, when someone joins a company and they're brand new at a company, what do most companies provide them with? They provide them with mentors. They provide them with education. They provide them with a lot of validation. They provide them with very concrete things for them to get started with. You want to do the same thing for the casual phase of your community. And the goal, in my mind, is throughout, throughout this journey is 66 days. Scientifically, it takes 66 days to build a habit, whether you want to get fit, whether you want to stop drinking, whether you want to join a community. And when you can get someone to join for 66 days fairly consistently, then they enter into the regulars phase. And at that point, um, you know, you, you, you apply your strategy to that piece as well. The key thing in my mind is you're always, you're weaving in pieces that move people forward from the minute they discover your community to how they get up that on ramp to get into the casual, into the regular, into the core. And that's one of the reasons why I think being intentional about communities is so, is so critical. It's not about frankly, just, signing people up to newsletters and throwing social media out there. Those are tactics that need to sit in terms of a wider strategy. Well, and I think that's, that's the kind of the, the thing that talking about jobs of the future, right? Um, it does require some deep understanding and expertise. Um, and you talked a lot about the whole human psychology element, um, right? Neuroscience, um, talking about, you know, motivations, the science of motivation. There's several different yeah. sciences that are involved with being able to have a successful community. Can you get yeah. on some of those sciences a little bit? This is what I find so exciting about this. Like I've been, it's funny, uh, on a side note, I, we, my family just got a puppy recently and we hired a dog trainer to help us, you know, <laughs> train the dog. And he's been doing it for 40 years. And the first session I had with him, he said, I love doing this. This is what I love about this. He's as excited about it as he was on day one. And I feel the same way about my career. One of the things that I love about this is it's this fascinating intersection of, like I said earlier on, psychology and technology and workflow. The psychology piece, I think, is particularly interesting. So some of your, your, um, your audience members may be familiar with behavioral economics, which is the, the, the science of we, as human beings, act in very irrational ways. Like you, we should eat healthy all the time. We should save for retirement. We should, you know, shouldn't drink much alcohol. We shouldn't take any drugs. But what do people do? You know, they drink, they drink too much. They eat fast food. After they've drunk too much, they don't save for retirement. We do these things, but we do them in consistent ways. Uh, we're, we're predictably irrational, as Dan Ariely wrote a book on. A lot of this offers like a psychological blueprint for how communities operate. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One is something called the IKEA effect, which is, you know, if you went and bought an IKEA table and I went and bought exactly the same table and we both produced, built them ourselves, you'd think your table was better than mine. And I would think my table was better than yours. And the reason for that is because we overvalue our own creations. Now, we know that scientifically, and that therefore has massive implications for how you build collaborative environments where you've got peer review. Like a very common thing in communities is someone produces something and then the community provides input and review on that and to main, A, maintain quality, but it also provides fantastic feedback for the original personal, the person who produced the original piece of work. So if we know that we overvalue each other's creations, therefore we know we should have an objective way of putting in place peer review. You know, another example is, is that we as human beings consistently mimic our leaders. Um, and so consequently, one of the questions I get from a lot of journalists is, okay, we, we've got a lot of kind of outrage culture right now and, and in many cases, bad leadership in businesses. How do you deal with that? And one element of this is not just setting the right kind of expectations around conduct, but it's also instilling good leadership because people will mimic their leaders but you need to teach people how to be good leaders. And so that can trickle downhill. So to me, it's, it's an understanding of the behavioral sciences piece, um, I think is one element, but the other element as well is just understanding the drivers behind why people 
join communities and why people operate in the way that they do. So one of the things I talk about early in the book is, I mentioned this earlier in this interview, is we want to get to that, that sense of belonging. The way in which we get to belonging is we need to have access to the ability to participate in one way, and then we need to be able to make contributions and build a sense of self-confidence. And when you build a sense of self-confidence because that contribution loop is, is successful, it builds a real sense of dignity, which is kind of inner peace in our grouping. And when you keep doing that, you move to that sense of, of, of belonging. And what pushes all of that forward is social capital, which is this kind of free-flowing, unspoken currency, which is not just doing great work, but it's also the tonality in how you do that work. Like everybody who's listening to this or watching this will be familiar with those amazing colleagues that you've worked with who don't just do great work, but they're kind, they have empathy. You want to be around them. That generates as much social capital as the work itself. So, so as you're talking, I mean, I'm starting to think much like we build uh, career paths, you know, within an organization, hmm. kind of have to build member paths for our community as well. Because yeah. that, that, that adding value back to that person, enriching them, having them come out with something better if they were to ever leave community, is what's going to help to continue to feed and grow the community. Yeah, you know, Jim, that's it's a really I never really thought about that. That's a good point is that in 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 really strong businesses you have a there is a career progression path, right? And it gives people um a reason a, a sense of momentum. Um and one of the things another psychological piece that's so critical here is the the value of 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 meaning. Um is that we all want to do work that's meaningful. Like I mentioned Dan Ariely earlier on, I, th I can't remember which book he wrote this in. I think it was Predictably Rational, but he talked about um, you know, a guy who was working on a mergers and acquisition strategy, and he spent weeks working on this presentation deck. He was sleeping at work under his desk and the whole, the whole nine yards. And then the deal was called off, and he was completely devastated. And even though he'd enjoyed the work and he felt like he was doing great work throughout all of that, it just didn't, it, it erased that memory because it wasn't going to have the meaning that it intended. And that's why, you know, that the, the core ethos and the goals of the community is as critical as the pieces that you put in place. Um, so, you know, that journey that I mentioned earlier on really is kind of the equivalent of carving out that kind of career journey in the company. And so when I start thinking about, you know, all of the different elements and components and the potential value uh, that getting this right can add to an organization, I mean, it's quite significant. So mm. if you could, with the communities that you've been involved with, kind of give us a little bit of perspective of magnitude of growth and timeline. Because I think that's important. Because you and I also had the opportunity to talk about it. It's like, <laughs> this doesn't happen overnight. This is not a build, right. this is not a build it and then hold them back because they're going to come flooding in thing. Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, one thing you know that I, I I say a few times in People Power is I I try to be like I'm an optimist. I'm definitely a glass half full. I think there's enormous amounts of opportunity in the world for most people, um, but I'm a realist. Like this is it, it takes time. There is no silver bullet. There's no guarantee. Right. The the, the recommendations, the approach that I've used over the years. Uh, is the most reliable approach that I've found, but there's no guarantee that it will work for everybody. Um, and I think, therefore, what we see is we see growth figures that vary somewhat depending on the focus and the, 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 the goal of the community and, and the appetite of the potential members of that community and also kind of the sector that it's in. So, for example, in technology and in the, the open source world with with the collaborative model, we've seen remarkable success. We've seen like huge projects such as Linux, Kubernetes, TensorFlow, uh, OpenStack, Ubuntu. These projects have had massive growth and have really impacted how technology is built and delivered. Um, and the op open source is basically the way in which technology is built today. It is the way in which we do business now. And that is fundamentally driven by communities. The companies that succeed there are the ones that do that well. Um, but we've seen um, communities in other areas be a little bit more variable. Like I've worked, for example, with some contracting organizations that are focused on construction. And that's more difficult because a lot of people who work in construction, the people who are the owners um, and the, the, the kind of the general contractors, um, they don't spend, you know, they, in many cases, they operate only by phone, sometimes by fax and occasionally by email. So it's it's possible to build strong 
regional in-person communities like mixers and events and things like that. But if you want to build a more typical uh, you know, set of events that's with, with the electronic pieces that are weaved in, it's much more complicated to do that because that audience is by definition, they sure they've got a phone in their pocket, but they're on site most of the time. They're not sat you know, in front of a computer. They're, the dynamics are, are just different. And, uh, and there's, there's a whole flurry of those pieces in between that sit there. What's exciting to me is that we're finding more and more use cases where we see these kind of hockey stick growth curves in new and interesting areas. So I'll give you one example. Uh, one of the, the contributors to People Power that I was really proud of is this guy called Joseph Gordon Levitt, who's an Emmy Award winning actor. He was in Snowden, you know, he was in Looper and all these different movies. And I met him backstage at a conference that we were both keynoting. And he built a community called Hit Record. And this is, it brings together artists, musicians, filmmakers, storytellers. And what they do is they come together to work on a shared production. And many of these productions have been showcased at Sundance. And they've got hundreds of thousands of artists around the world who are, who are working together on that. There weren't many communities that I'd seen that had done that well before, but they, they, again, they kind of figured out another piece of the puzzle. So my, my belief is if you have an audience that's interested in what you do, um, and you feel like there are ways in which you can provide value to them through technology, support, documentation, events, whatever else, you can build a community. Well, and as you were saying it too, I think it's also important to note that, you know, once you think you have it figured out, think again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting you say that. I remember I used to work for a company called Canonical and I was there for about eight years and I left in 2014. Uh, and I'd written my previous book, The Art of Community, and you know, I ran a conference called the Community Leadership Summit. And I remember leaving the company thinking, ah, I've got this community business all figured out. The amount that I've learned <laughs> in the last five years is astronomical compared to what I knew back then. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to consult because I, re I just came to the conclusion that there's so much more I don't know. Uh, and that makes it fun because I would hate to be in a position where you feel like, all right, well, we'll figure all this out. I've completed the video game. There's nothing more to learn. So. Well, I think that's the, you know, that's the both beauty and frustration of dealing with humanity, whether it's customer, right. customer experience, community management, development. I mean, it just goes, you know, healthcare, it just goes on and on. Government. It does. You're right. Crazy now. Yep. Okay. Yep. So when I start thinking about all this, I mean, we have to stay motivated ourselves. Um, yes. One of the ways that we do that at the call senior, uh, the, the uh, Fast Leader Show is we look at quotes. Um, hmm. Is there a quote or two that you like that helps to motivate you? You know, um, I'll be honest with you. I'm terrible at, uh, at remembering quotes and lyrics, um, but there's a couple of things that I think relate to this. The one quote that really has always kind of stuck by me is, and uh, I don't think we really know where it comes from, is this too shall pass. And the idea being that... Um, I, I think the story is, is that there was some leader of an army years ago who basically, um, you know, lost a huge battle and lost a bunch of his, his army. Um, and one of his friends basically went away and, and created this motto, this too shall pass, that he then basically tattooed on his arm. And the point was, in the worst possible moments, it will pass. You, like, you will find a way forward. Um, and I'm a huge believer in stoicism, um, this, you know, this notion that we can train ourselves for how to deal with adversity effectively. And it's a very stoic term. I think this came later than the original stoics back here, thousands of years ago. Um, but also when things are, re are really good and everything's going great, it's going to pass too. So, um, you know, I, again, like I say, I'm, I'm pretty terrible with quotes, but stoicism for me has been one of the most critical elements that's impacted my career. Like if I'm being completely honest with you, when I was younger, I used to worry about everything. I was, I wouldn't say I was fearful, but I was nervous. Um, and I think some of it was, I came from a fairly rural background and, you know, entered into this ridiculous technology world. And, uh, you know, I didn't do very well at school. You know, I got two D's and E and an N, uh, and with my grades, you know, and, uh, but when I discovered communities and the value of, of this, it really kind of transformed a lot of, 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 uh, of, of what I've done. But you always have those doubts. And stoicism is an incredibly powerful way. There's a book called The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday that I'd encourage everybody to read. Where it basically says, 
just when things are really difficult, you can find an opportunity that's inside of that obstacle. Um, and it, that speaks to me because I'm frankly a bit suspicious of all of these kind of self-help people who walk on hot coals and all that kind of business. I just think it's a bit ridiculous, but I like how practical stoicism is. So, I think that I think you bring up some really interest, interesting points in regards to that. Um, I mean, I always refer to my wife as being very stoic, right? Um, you know, because it doesn't seem like things rattle her. Yeah. Uh, however, inside she may be going nuts. <laughs> Well, the thing is, as well, is you can't you can't take the humanity. Like, there's been times in my in my life where, um, you know, really serious things have happened, and I've I've remained relatively calm and stoic. But I tell you one thing: if I see you change lanes on a freeway without using your turn signal, it drives me bonkers. Like, it's just it's something about that that winds me up. So, you know, it's part of the human condition. It is. This is the beauty of it. Okay, so you also mentioned something about the learning that has accelerated for you with doing consulting and having all these tons of different perspectives and work and all that. Um, and so one of the things I think um, I'd like to talk about is one of the things that's very common for others is about getting over the hump. Now, whether or not it's in relation into that learning or something else, but we can learn a lot by hearing other people's stories of one they've had to you know, overcome and try out. Mm, Is there a time mm. where you've gotten over the hump that you can share? Oh, there's been, there's been a whole bunch. Um, um, I, I, I think stories are a really, val they're a vessel for learning. You know, it's how human beings share experience, I think. And because part of it in my mind is there is, there is a lesson in every story. Um, and, and it's, and part of the fun is picking out what that lesson is in some ways. Um, you know, there's, there's been various ones across the course of my career. I mean, you know, I mentioned earlier on the fact that uh, I, I wasn't a very um, interested student at school. Uh, this is an early example where um, in, in England, you basically do your GCSEs, which are your basic learning. And I got primarily C's in that. And but when I started my A-levels, which are the two years between finishing school, uh, mandatory education, and then going to university, like the level of work goes up significantly. And around that time, I joined my first band. And I was completely distracted by music. And that, hence the two Ds and E and an N. And an, an N is, I think, spelling your name wrong in the exam paper. It's that bad. And so I, when that happened, you know, my little 18-year-old ego took a pretty serious dent. And I was going to be the first person in my family to go to university. And I knew it meant a lot to my parents. And uh, so I just... You know, we went and to, to the ultimate, you know, the, 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 the university I ended up going to, and I effectively taught my way in. And I said to myself, like, I am going to, I'm never going to have that happen to me again. Like, I'm going to, it, it was like a wake up call in many ways. And one of the things that I learned over the years was knowing your own psychology and how your psychology tends to react to things. So, one of the things I've discovered about myself is that may or may not apply to your to your audience members is is having a series of simple goals and also you know being a little cheeky and do you think we can actually do this like you know do you think we could because my view is if you don't ask you don't get right so um so i think um i think that was one element another element of me i think was was when i started my business because to be honest with you i you know, I'd, I'd left Canonical, I'd been at XPRIZE, I'd been at GitHub, and I was, I'd always had this urge to see if I could build uh, my own business and, and run my own consulting practice um, and learn more about what I'm doing from other companies. But you have that nervousness of, is there going to be any business out there? Or, you know, and my wife was running a startup at the time, so she was taking a very limited salary because all of her value was tied up in equity. And, you know, we have a kid. So is this something that's going to work? And I just had this sense of, you know what? sod it i'm just going to get out there and give it a go and and see what happens and uh and i've learned more and more a screw it philosophy um that in many cases it generally works out fine and actually the hardest lessons in your life are the most valuable ones um i'll give you one more example that i i've, I've mentioned before to some people was um, I did a, I was asked to do a keynote for a, a very large tech conference called OSCON. This was five or six years ago. This was in front of five, four or 5,000 people. I had 15 minutes, like a lot of these keynotes. And I had my separate 40 minute presentation during the day. And I thought to myself, and I, you know, 40 minute presentation, no problem. I'd done a load of those. And I was really struggling to put together a 15 minute presentation. And, um, 
uh, because I like to tell a story in my talks. And I, I was like, how can I do this in 10, 15 minutes? So I got up and I did it and it sucked. It was terrible. It was an objectively bad keynote. And I got off the stage and I said to my friend, you know, it wasn't good, was it? And he said, some people are good at writing short stories and some people are good at writing uh, uh, novels. My friend Steve Wally said that. Um, and I got off the stage, I was mortified. I felt like I'd embarrass myself in front of my whole industry and I'd ruin this opportunity. Um, and I thought, what's the best way to deal with this? So I wrote a blog post that day that said, I just keynoted Oscon and it was terrible. And these are the things that I've learned. Uh, and a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said, it was really refreshing to see someone be that open about things. And I think sometimes that's the approach that I've taken to getting over the hump is just challenge yourself, be vulnerable, and, and you'll get there. Well, I think, you know, thanks for sharing that. Because for me, as I was listening to you, I started also saying that, you know what, you just need to put things behind you. Yeah, which is hard, easy said than done, right? It is. But I think some of it, and I, I don't know whether this is just me, I just turned 40, I think an element of this is just getting older, of just thinking, you know what, whatever. Um, sometimes it's, I think you just got to say whatever. Like I, I always say to myself, my philosophy is, I refer to it as my rocking chair moment, which is when I get to be a very old man, uh, hopefully, <laughs> and you know, my friends uh, have all died off, um, you know, my gin drinking uh, lifestyle has, has, has made me healthy that um, no one looks back and says, I wish I'd worked more. Everybody looks back and says, I wish I'd spent more time with my family, with my friends. I wish I'd focused on my passions more. And that is, that is with me every single day. It's one of the, one of the main reasons why I'm a consultant is because I want to be at home so I can see my son. Like it's, it's not just work. And I think some of that is saying, you know, when something goes wrong, thinking, is anyone going to remember this? No, probably not. <laughs> Okay, so when I, you know, you talked about this, you know, maturation process of yourself and, you know, really embarking on what, for me, what I see is the very, very early adopter stage of, of benefiting from, you know, the, and the, getting the power of, of community, even though you've been at it for a while, this is still really new stuff. Um, it is, yeah. Yeah. So, but when I think about goals, um, what is one goal that you have for all of this? Um. <laughs> The the one goal, and this is, I like goals to be concrete, and this sadly is not very concrete. My goal is when I leave this planet, um, I want us as a species to be better at, at collaborating together in communities. And I want to play a role in shaping that. You know, it's a fairly broad ambition. Like, I know we're better together as, as a species. Um, sure, there are downsides of people get like people do get together and they do bad things, but I think uh, as a general rule, the, the human condition is a kind one, and um, and I want to do everything that I can to understand the blueprint for that and to communicate it outwards. And I don't think it necessarily means having all of the answers. I think it just means, in many cases, packaging up the right answers in a way that's easily consumable. Uh, but that's my number one goal. Um, I don't particularly care about, you know being incredibly wealthy, uh, you know, perfectly fine financially. That's my number one goal. So, And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy to use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Jonah. Hope they hold on as a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you questions and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Jonah Bacon, are you ready to hold down? I will do my best to hold down. All right. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Um, I think what's holding me back, honestly, is I need to craft my message better. I think I'm still discovering how to get what I want to do and get the value of this out to a broader audience. So I'm learning every day. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Um, don't take yourself too seriously uh, and try hard. And what is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? Um, I think one of the secrets is, is I, 
I'm an eternal student. I'm, I'm always wanting to learn and grow. And I, I look at myself critically, but not too critically. And what is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Um, friends. Uh, friends, uh, colleagues, I've spent a lot of time, not intentionally, just getting to know good people. And uh, I'm, I'm boosted and buoyed by the great people that I've got to know over the years. And what would be one book that you recommend to our Legion? And it could be from gen any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to People Powered on your show notes page as well. Right. The book that I would recommend, uh, two books, actually, if I can have two. Um, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey is an unbelievable book for the way in which you approach your life and your career. And I mentioned this earlier on, but The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday is a fantastic book for really seeing the value that is surrounding us, even in our hardest moments. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash Jono Bacon. Okay, Jono, this is my last hump day hold on question. But imagine you've given, been given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25 and you can take the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can only take one. You can't take it all. So what knowledge or piece of skill would you take back with you and why? What I would take back is the importance of, of measuring and reacting to what you measure. I wasn't doing enough of that when I was 25. Um, I was feeling my way forward uh, in terms of my career and what I was trying to do. And, and I wish I'd, I wish I'd uh, read more and I wish I'd uh, measured what I was doing and evaluated it as, as I was doing it each day. Essentially being a detective, being Columbo, uh, being Quincy, <laughs> to, to, to see what is surrounding me. Uh, I didn't have that visibility when I was 25 and I would do that in a heartbeat. Jono, I've had fun with you today. Can you uh, tell the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Yeah, it's been a blast and I really appreciate having me on. You can, uh, people can go to jonobacon.com. That's J-O-N-O -O bacon, like the delicious meat.com. Uh, and you can find out more about my work, about the book, about other things uh, right there. And then also on Twitter is probably another way um, just John Bacon is my hashtag. And also, frankly, I just love to have a really direct relationship with people. So if you, I'm happy to, for, for people to email me, Jono at JonoBacon.com. If there's anything that you want to talk about, drop me a note. Jono Bacon, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thank you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster.